we will start. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our first 2023 uh, meeting. And uh, it's great to see so, uh, so many uh, familiar faces and uh, one or two new ones. So if this is your first meeting, welcome. Uh, so this is our potpourri meeting. So we've got uh, uh, some short talks by uh, various members. I wanted to start out tonight uh, just giving you an update on uh, our meeting schedule. Uh, we're going to hold our January meetings uh, via Zoom. Uh, and that is just a uh, uh, couple reasons for that. One is we don't have the meeting rooms um, reserved in January yet because we can't do that until all of the classes have been set and the university is still working on that. So we decided to take advantage of, uh, of using Zoom for January. The February uh, potpourri uh, on the 10th uh, will be a UTM meeting as, as at this point, and we'll use that to uh, hold our first uh, UTM slash Zoom meeting. So that'll be our first uh, hybrid meeting. And we'll uh, use that opportunity to get ready for the AGM, which is on the 24th. Um, at this point, uh, we'll have a sh uh, we plan to have a short talk before the, uh, the AGM. Uh, as many as you know, Betty and I went to Antarctica in uh, late November, early December. So we're going to uh, uh, show you some of our uh, experiences there. Uh, and the talk before the AGM is usually uh, a shorter talk so that we can uh, take the time to, uh, uh, to hold the meeting. So uh, we'll do that. We'll start the, uh, the presentation at eight o'clock and then uh, take a short break after it. Then by nine o'clock, we'll be ready to have our annual meeting. So I uh, would uh, encourage everyone to come out for that or attend via Zoom. Uh, and uh, it'll be an opportunity for us to talk about uh, 2022, which in many ways was very busy. And uh, in many ways, well, let's just hope 2023 is better in, in, in various ways. Um, the other thing I wanted to do, uh, is encourage people to uh, uh, volunteer. Uh, we're always looking for people to help out uh, in various ways to run the center. Now that we're going to be back uh, more uh, in person, um, we've got various activities where we could use some help. Uh, take a look at our a, um, committee list on our website. And if any of that in interests you, uh, we encourage you to uh, uh, to volunteer and if you have any questions about it just uh, send me an email we can chat and uh, we can talk i sent out a call for help for the public education committee the other day and i got a great response so that's great so uh uh thank you we're, we're not only looking for people to help uh with the actual events but also to plan some events as well so we're looking for people to help with uh uh the various committees and uh take a look and give me a call uh if you uh if you are interested so with that, I'm going to uh, call on our first uh, speaker, uh, Rick Vergen. Uh, he's going to talk to us about a new solar telescope. So this should be uh, be interesting. Rick, it's all yours. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. You're loud and clear. Okay. Good. Let's uh, share. Okay. Are you uh, seeing my presentation? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, um, yeah, I'm gonna talk about um, my first light with some solar prominence images and actually some videos with my new Lunt 60MT solar telescope. Um, so the Lunt uh, LS60MT is the one I got. It's a modular telescope. So it does solar and night and visual or photography. And um, if you get all the attachments, if you can afford it, you can do calcium K solar viewing, you can do white light solar viewing, and you can do hydrogen alpha solar viewing as well. Um, so uh, it's a, a relatively small aperture, but uh, because the seeing isn't usually great around the sun, you don't really need a, a really big aperture to get some pretty good pictures. So it's 60 millimeters, a uh, focal length is 420 millimeters, so it's F7. And uh, it's an ED doublet objective. Um, and because it's modular, um, you can enable some very quick changes to it. So 
Uh, I've marked here, uh, here's the telescope. There's a, a pressure tuned hydrogen alpha etalon. And that's the, the main thing, the most uh, expensive part of this. Uh, and this is where you, you do your tuning for the hydrogen alpha. If you want to do night or white light, solar or calcium imaging, this just slides right out. Um, this is the focuser. And then at the back, there's another filter. It's a, an additional hydrogen alpha blocking filter. If you want to do night use, you remove it and you can put in a normal diagonal or you can replace this with a calcium or a white light solar diagonal, uh, depending on what you want to look at. Now, the uh, uh, telescope I got is the one with a hydrogen alpha etalon and a 12 millimeter filter. And that's about 4,000 Canadian all in with you know, all the charges and duties and taxes and everything. Um, if you want, you can also get a second hydrogen alpha etalon, which is called double stacking, uh, but it's pretty pricey. It's about another 3000. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, why you'd want or not want to do that. Um, you can also get a calcium solar filter, which is for photography only, and that's about $2,000. And there's a white light solar filter, about 600. Now, uh, by the way, the calcium and white light don't require the, the etalon, so you don't necessarily need to purchase that um, if you just want to do calcium or white light. Um, so I actually got this from Lunt directly um, because they could actually tell me when I might get it. And also I was able to ask them lots of questions. So it was actually about a four month lead time. And I just received it near the end of November last year. Okay, so um, let me talk a little bit about how uh, an Etalon work. It's kind of a neat uh, uh, little device. So um, the uh, hydrogen alpha Etalon is, is uh, centered at 656.28 nanometers exactly with a 0.7 nanometer full width half maximum. So it's a very nar narrow filter, uh, but it gives about 80% transmission. This is actually an interference filter. And one property of these interference filters is you, you get these side bands uh, through the etalon. So if hydrogen alpha is coming in, you also have a few side bands that are, are letting some light through and that has to be blocked by the later filter. Now, um, because this frequency is so precise, you have to be able to tune it. If it's not tunable, it would be pretty uh, uh, non-useful. So the, the problem is if there's any change in temperature and pressure, like your altitude, your weather, um, that actually causes the etalon wavelength to shift. Um, and so you have to be able to adjust for that. And also the other interesting feature is uh, depending on the source of the hydrogen alpha, if your solar features are moving toward us, then it's gonna be shifted to the blue side of the spectrum. And if it's moving away from us, there's actually a red shift. So you have to be able to adjust, if you're looking at surface features, you have to be able to adjust the hydrogen alpha wavelength of the etalon. So it's exactly on the right frequency. Now, if you're looking at things on the limb, those are moving perpendicular to us. And so those are not shifted, those, those stay put. Um, and so it's a little bit different than if you're observing on the limb versus observing surface features. Now, you can add a second etalon, which looks exactly like the first one. And the advantage is it decreases the full width half maximum further. And, and it actually multiplies. So if you had 0.7 nanometer full width half maximum, then you get 0.7 times 0.7. So you get about 0.49 nanometers. And what that means is you get a lot more contrast. Uh, which is important when you're looking at surface features versus the bright disc. Because obviously if you're looking right at the disc, there's a lot of uh, stray light that uh, can be coming through. So you really do benefit if you're looking at surface features. However, if you're looking at features on the limb, my understanding is doesn't really do very much to have the second etalon because now you're looking at something that's 
basically against the sky. So there's a, a lot of contrast anyway, and, and you don't really need it. Um, and then there's a second blocking filter, um, which just blocks these ethylon sidebands and also any remaining UV and IR. Uh, and so you, uh, it's, it's also gives you a little bit of uh, extra safety factor here, blocking out all the radiation that might hurt you or hurt your camera sensor. Uh, a little bit more on how the etalon works. If we look at the center picture here, where our features are not moving, uh, let's look at what the, how the etalon actually works. So it has these two parallel uh, plates. They're actually coded, so they're somewhat reflective. Um, and when the light comes in, there's actually a culminating lens. And the reason is, these are exactly parallel plates. And if we want the frequency width of this etalon to be very precise and not shift, all the light has to come in parallel. If it comes in an angle, it'll shift the, the wavelength. So the light has to be culminated. So it comes in parallel through the etalon, and then it's refocused with this refocusing lens, we can actually see an image. And the way it works actually is, is really simple. So that big knob I was showing you, you turn it, and that applies an air pressure, which just changes the density of the air around these two optical elements. So the change in the air pressure actually changed the refractive index of the air itself, changing the transmission wavelength. So by increasing the pressure, we can tune to look at something that's coming out of the sun, like a, a plum prominence or a flare that's coming up, and that's blue shifted. Or if we want to look at something sinking into the sun, we can tune it the other way, bring the pressure down, and we get a uh, to compensate. So we get a red shift, and now we can see things that are sinking into the sun. So it, it uh, you can select features based on their Doppler motion, which is kind of interesting. And the other neat thing about it is you can adjust very quickly for ambient pressure and temperature changes over a wide range. Um, and uh, so this is actually the new Lunt Etalon. Um, previous Etalons from other companies or, or from Lunt are uh, either use heat, which is slow to tune, or they tilt the optical elements, which leads to banding artifacts. So this new system they have is, is really quite neat. I, I know I sound like an ad, but I can tell you it was really easy to use and really easy to tune. Um, now, in terms of my setup, I mean, the good news is, uh, you know, the telescope's horrifically expensive, uh, but all the other stuff is, is, is uh, uh, pretty inexpensive. You don't need a, a really fancy uh, camera. So I actually had a ZWO ASI 120mm S monochrome camera. It's about $180 Canadian. It's a relatively small frame, but this is, it's almost big enough. It's about 4.8 by 3.6 millimeters. Um, but there's another advantage with a small frame is you get a very fast capture, which is important because you, know, you wanna capture as many images as you can while the sun is not moves, it moving. So you wanna sort of freeze the motion. And uh, with this camera, it's got 3.75 micron pixels. And that means I've got about 1.6 arc second per pixel which is a reasonably good match for the 2.4 arc second telescope resolution. And actually I found, uh, I used Drizzle, uh, which is a, uh, a software technique which increases the pixel resolution by three times. I do that in post-processing uh, and that really helps as well. So it gives me a little bit uh, better pixel resolution, um, uh, which just gives you a smoother image. And the other thing I noticed right away I tried 12-bit uh, versus 8-bit captures and I found 12-bit were way, way better in terms of detail and smoothness than 8-bit. So um, I'd cert certainly recommend not using 8-bit and, and using a higher uh, bit for, for capture. Um, the other thing that you have to think about when you're uh, trying to do solar during the day um, I have a Celestron CGX equatorial mount, which is great, uh, except how do you polar align 
to Polaris in daylight. And uh, so the technique I worked, uh, used, uh, which seemed to work pretty well, was I just leveled the mount and then I told the telescope to solar align. And when you, you do that, the telescope moves to where the sun should be, assuming you were polar aligned and level. And so, uh, of course, I wasn't polar aligned, so it wasn't pointing anywhere in the right direction at all, but I just adjusted the mount altitude and azimuth, like not the controls, but just physically moving the mount until the sun was centered. And, uh, and so then you're pretty much polar aligned. And it, it, it did work quite well. Hmm. Um, the other thing uh, in terms of software, um, I use SharpCap and there is a free version of that available, although I, I use the pro version, but there is a free version of that. Or you can use ACCAP, which is a ZWO's uh, capture software, which is also free. And then once you capture the images, uh, there's a program called AutoStackert. Again, it's free. And basically what it does is it selects the best images in the raw files and stacks them, registers and stacks them uh, to give you the, the best uh, possible stack of images. And then I use Registack to bring out details using a technique called wavelet sharpening. And then you can use either Photoshop or there's a free program called IMPPG, which is specifically designed for solar imaging. You can use that to finalize and, and colorize the image. Or, and, and finally, you can use Photoshop or another program, PIPP, again, free to, to make videos. Um, so uh, the good news is you don't have to spend a lot of money uh, because you don't have any left. <laughs> um, OK. So um, this is actually, um, I'm not gonna show these videos. So when I, I take raw images, I, I take uh, what are called SER raw video files. Uh, this is by far the best type of file to use for, for imaging, um, video imaging, um, because um, it's a raw file format, it's not compressed. So it, it doesn't do anything to the images. So the idea here is when you take a video file uh, in 30 seconds, which I'm, I was hoping would freeze most of the solar feature motions, I can capture a lot of frames. And, and the capture was about 30 frames per second. So for the surface video, I took in that 30 seconds about 800 exposures of 0.8 milliseconds each. So this is actually a video file then of 800 uh, individual images, individual frames, and you can see some some sunspots here just in the raw image. And uh, then the image on the uh, right hand side is a prominence video. Uh, this is uh, 800 frames at 13 millisecond exposures, and you can see to see the prominence, which you can you can see on the uh, upper uh, left hand side. Uh, you need to take uh, longer exposures, a, a little bit like 15 times longer, so about 13 milliseconds in this case. So the disc is overexposed, but now you can see the, the prominences. Now I can't play these videos easily. They're, they're really large and uh, I need a special viewer to, to show them. So I won't show you the raw data, but I will show you uh, my first images. So, um, the first light for this was on November 28th. I remember it clearly because it was <laughs> the only uh, good day of sun that I had. I had a whole three hours in the morning of sun. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't great, it, seeing was average and there was some haze, but at least I could see the sun. So I stacked uh, 200 frames, so I took using auto stackard, I took the best 25% of those 800 frames and they're stacked and registered. And uh, now this full disk image I'm showing you here that I took is a composite of two stacks actually, because my camera sensor is big enough to get the full solar disk uh, east-west, but north-south it cuts it off just, just a little bit. So I, I really need to do two frames to get a full image. 
uh, and you can see there's uh, a nice big uh, uh, area of prominence is at the north side and also at the southeast side and, and also a smaller one on, on the southwest. So I, I was able to get some, some uh, really nice capture here of, of the prominences. Now I made, because the disc is overexposed, what I did in Photoshop was I, I told it wherever it's overexposed, it's gonna be black. So it gives you a sort of a, a solar eclipse look with a black disc and, and the prominences uh, lighting up the edges. Um, and amazingly, this is my only usable solar time to date. I'm, I'm sort of hoping for tomorrow, crossing my fingers. Um, now this is a close up of the two major prominent series I took. So again, the, the one on, on the southeast and the one on the, on the north. And you can see quite, quite nice detail. Again, I, I was really happy for, for first go how, how easy it was to, to focus and use and, and take some, some images. Uh, uh, my biggest struggle was that polar alignment, but anyway, <laughs> and getting the sun centered and so on. Um, and then I hope you can see this. Uh, this is a, a 9.5 minute video animation. Uh, it's uh, 30 seconds of captures. So I took 30 seconds of captures every minute uh, for the nine minutes. So it, it covers nine and a half minutes in total. Mm -hmm. And I hope you can see uh, the flow uh, in the image. It's actually, uh, you can see movement from, from the uh, upper left to the lower right. So it runs, this video runs and it stops for a second or so, and then it repeats. So I hope you can see that. Yeah, looks good. And then this is that prominence at the north. And in this case, you can see it's moving uh, from right to left. So sort of in the same direction on the, on the edge of the, the solar disk. I have no idea why everything is moving in that direction, but I think you can see here, there are some, some bits that are, are moving in that direction. Excellent. So I have to say after this one trial, I, I really love my Lunt. Um, you know, I like to think of it, it's like a solar eclipse every clear day. Um, <laughs> the only thing is I really hadn't realized that every clear day is about as often as a total solar eclipse anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, uh, Rick. I'm gonna stop you there. Are there any questions for Rick? Chris, Chris Malicki had a question. Chris, yep. can you ask your question? Or I can read it. Yeah, so um, I wrote that the, um, the etalon you said is, is, there's a filter that blocks the wavelengths on either side, but I'm wondering why would you want to do that? Like if, if you don't block those wavelengths, then you would simply get three different wavelengths coming in and so you sort of get more color like I would think that you would want to have those yeah the no. side bands in there like why block no, so, them so so the hydrogen so the thing is hydrogen the hydrogen alpha band is extremely narrow it's extremely narrow uh it's narrower than 0.49 nanometers I'm, I'm not sure exactly what the width is but the hydrogen alpha band I mean ignoring the motion part, uh, the band is extremely narrow. So these side bands, which are, I don't know, they're probably 15 nanometers or something away. They're just bringing in basically white light or well, it's red light. They bring in <laughs> red light from the sun. Yeah, but aren't, they, is, but aren't those also images of the sun, those side they're bands? Image, they're images of the sun, but they're images in normal red light not in hydrogen alpha. So we're looking particularly at the emission from hydrogen alpha, which is, is uh, where the, the prominence of these solar features are strong uh, and gives you the contrast. If, if you just look in white light, you just see 
you know, uh, sunspots and so on, or red light. So it's only in hydrogen alpha that you really pick up the prominences. Well, I think calcium as well, you, you can potentially see prominences, although I haven't seen a lot of people doing that. So hydrogen alpha, that particular frequency is the only one you want. Everything else just washes out that, uh, that image that, I mean, otherwise you could just use uh, any red sort of red filter and you, you'd see what you wanna see. So the reason to, to get this telescope is you can look at a specific wavelength. Okay, hey, thanks. Thanks, yeah. Rick. I'm gonna stop you there. Thanks very much, yep. Rick. Yep. And uh, our next speaker is Ron McNaughton, who has uh, been viewing Mars. And I think he uh, actually saw a Mars lunar event, if I'm not mistaken. Hey, Ron, it's all yours. Uh, Randy, may I ask a question? Yeah, sure, Ali. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Rick, for the presentation. Uh -huh. I have a qu uh, question regarding Regis tax uh, software or tool. Uh, you introduced it before, but I couldn't download it. Could you please uh, send the link to the uh, group, uh, a working link to be able to download this tool or software, please? Okay, sure. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, just in the chat, that'd be great. Okay, thanks, Ellie. Thank you. Okay, Ron, you have the floor. Uh, is the screen projecting? It's perfect. Okay. Um, I, I mentioned a, a fair amount of this in, in the chat, uh, in the um, uh, forum when, um, when it happened and it was just a magical event for me. So, and I've got more details, so I uh, wanna share it with you. Um, it's strange, wait a minute, yeah, there. No, it's not advancing. There. <clears throat> um, on December the 7th last year, <clears throat> there were four unusual events all together. Uh, there was a full moon and an opposition of Mars, which meant that Mars was bright and it also was large compared to what it could be in other sizes. And the moon was occulting Mars <clears throat> and the Toronto Center had its annual meeting. And uh, anyway, I'm gonna uh, link them all. Um, just as solar eclipses start, uh, because that's a daytime event and this is the, uh, the one uh, next April, um, it starts at sunrise in the Pacific and it goes eastward and a relatively narrow path. And it ends at a sunset somewhere in Europe. And uh, I imagine most of us are gonna try and see it. Similarly, the occultation of Mars, it is a nighttime of time event, starts at uh, sunset somewhere over the Pacific. I don't know if Hawaii saw it or not. And it was a wider band. Um, uh, that uh, ended up uh, getting blocked and it ended at sunrise in Europe. And interestingly, um, Canada was pretty well situated. And of course we were uh, close to the bottom. Um, I'm including a whole bunch of pictures and I really like Brian's uh, uh, image and it shows the relative size of Mars, even though it's close with the, uh, uh, with the full moon. Um, this is an apod by Thomas Slavinsky, who is somewhere in Eastern Europe, I think it's Slovenia, and he obviously had his telescope centered on the moon, and he had uh, repeated photographs, and you could see the, uh, the thing. Uh, I'm not quite sure why the bottom is red. It could be that sunrise was happening at that moment, uh, or it could just be the moon was getting low and um, uh, you know, becoming red just as the sun does. Anyway, um, we had Mars and I think our actual position was a little further south than even this diagram, but uh, Mars seemed to go behind the moon and then come out or the moon goes this way. I mean, you know, it doesn't really matter how you describe uh, the relative motion. And uh, I did attend the uh, Toronto Center Generalist General Meeting and the odd time during an in-depth discussion of accounting practices, I would dash up to look and I saw awful conditions. I knew where the moon was. I had my telescope set up in my back porch and I saw absolutely uh, nothing. 
And just before the end, I told everybody, I can't even see where the moon is because I knew its location from a compass and, and everything. Um, these uh, are sometimes called God rays uh, and they're just so beautiful to see. And sometimes certain clouds have certain narrow beams that come down and the rest is relatively dark. And my guess, if you can see my cursor, is the actual position of the sun is somewhere here and the clouds are so thick you can't see them. And I speculate that's what we had when uh, we were there. Um, it started to clear when I went back after the meeting and I could see enough to point the telescope at where the moon was and turn the motor on. I just used a cheap mount. I didn't bother with a full uh, polar alignment. And um, I got it on the moon and then it uh, just put in the low power eyepiece and almost got focus and then phew, clouded over. Then just before the moment, it sort of cleared and I was able to get the uh, focus for the low power eyepiece. I really wasn't sure whether I saw Mars because that's a pretty three degree field. So it was pretty small. Then I am um, uh, right next to the bright moon. Uh, then I put it on high power and fog, uh, clouds came. Then I waited for the 49 minutes, which is our predicted wait. And there was one moment when it was really clear and I got good focus on, on uh, the moon. And um, uh, here's a image from uh, Daniel Burns in Sky and Tell. And um, I wasn't quite sure where to point my telescope because, you know, it's a very narrow field with uh, on, on my highest power. And uh, Chris uh, Vaughn had talked about it in his talk that you look for uh, Tycho. And I went down from uh, Marie Cesium because, uh, you know, there's a left right flip in the uh, thing and I wanted to get it. So I was maybe this much of the moon was in my uh, a telescope and then I saw the red planet peeking behind the dark, the relatively colorless moon. And it was just so exciting for me. And it slowly went away. <clears throat> and um, you can see the features of the full moon. Um, it's actually better with the full moon. I think uh, originally I thought it would be bad and I could see some features on Mars and I didn't even think about using a camera because chances are I would miss the actual event and this is the only planetary occultation I've seen. Uh, anyway, here's a further blow up and you're there, this is from um, uh, Ethan Chapel on cloudy nights and I couldn't find him to ask him if he had more photos, but uh, his were the most stunning I was able to find. And I particularly enjoyed seeing the mountains um, that uh, are right on the edge of the moon. And look at how that mountain range is almost in shadow, but uh, a little bit. Then uh, Mars eventually moved away a little bit, although it ended up hugging the moon for a long distance. And uh, just as that was happening, the clouds came in again and I was uh, out of luck. Okay, so here's that map again. And it's interesting that this event, the solar eclipse in 2017, it was only in America. Well, this eclipse, this uh, occultation covered almost all of Canada. Maybe some people in Nova Scotia had trouble seeing it. I don't know by Halifax, but almost every Canadian to see it. And we have people all the way across the Canada and I hardly saw any photos from Canadian astronomers and I don't know whether it's socked out. I couldn't find it, but uh, I think his name is Tenho from Saskatchewan, sent an image in, but I couldn't find it. But I was hoping to see a great picture like I showed you. And to me, it would be a slam dunk to make the calendar. Um, full moons are very bright and I don't like looking at the full moon and usually I have a filter, but I didn't put it on for this. But because I was looking only at the very edge, it actually wasn't as bright here as it is in the center. And I was also very surprised at how bright Mars was compared to the moon that I thought would be 
50, 100 times brighter, but it's only a little bit brighter than Mars. It was really a remarkable experience. Um, anyway, we were actually a little south of this, so we had a narrow gap, but it turns out that um, uh, I, I found places that I've been to, well, three of the four, uh, Toronto, of course, Thunder Bay, where they had the GA, Iqaluit, where I taught, and um, uh, alert in the top of uh, Ellesmere Island. And I worked out, I found the times of exposure and as expected, a Kaluit gets a longer time. And I can't see with the zoom thing, but I think alert was something like 20 minutes and Thunder Bay uh, 69. So it's uh, uh, kind of interesting. So I'm gonna end with a few uh, A-pods. Uh, this is by of uh, 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 Mars, uh, from this year, uh, this is from um, 2003, and this wasn't a perfectly full moon. And this one from 2020. So these events are rare, but it's only a small patch of Earth. And what blew me away is the change in color. You can see surface features, or I can with my telescope, I can see surface features on two bodies the moon, and I so love looking at it when they're sharp shadows, and Mars, and it was all in one view. And I really encourage you, there wasn't that big a deal about this, but I encourage you to try if another one of these is coming up to see it, because of my observing experiences, I would rank it right near the top of my uh, wonderful experiences observing things. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ron, that was excellent. Um, any questions for Ron? I've never seen uh, an occultation of Mars. I saw Mars um, go in front of a rather bright star in Gemini once upon a time, and that was quite something. Uh, the only occultation I've seen with the planet is Saturn. I was surprised how dull Saturn was compared to uh, the moon. And, interesting that you thought that Mars looked uh, quite bright compared to the lunar surface. Well, I'm not saying Mars was brighter than the moon. It just, it wasn't nearly as faint compared to the moon as I expected. Yeah, okay. You Fair know, enough. but when mm -hmm. you look at it, Mars at that time, I think it's uh, 1.3 AU away from the sun. And the surface brightness depends to me on the distance from the sun. So that might mean Mars is, I don't know, two times less bright, you know, half as bright sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I don't remember what the albedo of yeah. general average albedo yeah. of Mars is compared to the moon either. Yeah. But, uh, but but given the apods from other years, these are relatively common. And, um, uh, you know, I might even consider like it, it almost ranks up with the total eclipse of the sun for me, having seen it. Excellent. And to travel to find a place with good weather, um, you know, with cameras and, and everything, I didn't even bother with it because it was cloudy and I didn't think I'd see anything. And I, I'm i glad I looked rather than taking a picture, but uh, it was just so stunning. Okay, thank you, Ron. Excellent, appreciate okay, it. Okay, so I stop share? Yes, please. Thanks, Randy. Yep, no, it's great. Always nice uh, to see talks like that, a great observing. Uh, Shaquille is up, uh, lunar eclipse, that excellent lunar eclipse yes. that many people saw because we had some half decent weather. Okay, so Shaquille, <laughs> it's, it's all yours. Okay, let me get started here then. You guys can see my screen? Mm -hmm. Okay, so thanks, Randy. Hi, everyone. So, oh. Is my Zoom, you can guys still see everything? It's good. Okay. I just got a message that Zoom quit. So uh, I'll just say no. Okay. So I'm just going to give you a brief overview of my experience with the, the last lunar eclipse in November, the blood moon eclipse. This was, uh, I've seen a lot of lunar eclipses, but this had its own charm. And um, I'll go through the planning and uh, the pictures that I took from the eclipse. So as in all uh, photographic experiences, planning, planning, and more planning is, is key to get a, a decent result. So I spent a, quite a bit of time 
looking into how I could get the best shot here. And just first of all, it was uh, a matter of what time should I get up early in the morning to catch the umbral phase of the eclipse. And according to this, it was started around four o'clock in the morning and mid eclipse would be around six o'clock in the morning. And from our location, the moon would be setting at around quarter to seven or so. So it'd be just about when it was exiting the umbral stage. So that gave me a good idea of uh, how little sleep I would get that morning. And I also wanted to take a look at the direction. So direction was important because, uh, so this is an image from Stellarium and um, it showed that the moon at full eclipse would be about west, due west. And for me, I would actually, I wanted to get a picture of the moon, the eclipse over the water. But this was actually exactly opposite the location for us in Mississauga because the water would be behind us, Lake Ontario would be behind us. So I had to uh, do a bit more planning to see if there was any water aside from my garden hose that I could use to show a bit of a uh, reflection or so on the moon. So I went to PhotoPills and this is a really good app to plan. I think most of you people, most of you guys know about this. Um, this gives you, you can just punch in whatever event that you're looking for and it will tell you what the different phases and what the different times are and locations. If you specify a location, it'll give you, um, you can go back and forth and figure out exactly where the moon will be relative to your, to your location. So I figured out that for, at mid eclipse, it gives you the right times here, that if I went down to this park called Lakefront Promenade Park, which is at Lakeshore and Cothra, I would have a bit of an inlet here where I could actually see the moon pass over water. So as you can see, as I mentioned, Lake Ontario and Toronto's skyline is on the wrong side of this eclipse. So I said, okay, I can use this little inlet here and see if I can get a decent shot of the eclipse. So then I went to Google Earth and Google, Google Maps actually, and saw what, because I'd never been to this park before. It, it's, it's um, and actually it's a very nice park, um, but I wanted to ensure also that it was open at that time, that there were no gates and if I could actually get in. And based upon some chatter, I realized that it was open. So I cross-referenced this uh, photo pills uh, map with the actual Google Earth uh, street map, street view picture. And I noticed that here's the, the ramp, the, the boat ramp over here. And if I situated myself either here or here, I would get a good shot of the moon coming down this way. And ultimately I decided to take a picture on this side, get my equipment set up on this side because I also wanted to get some foreground into the picture as well. So set up an execution. So I arrived at the location at about 3.30 a.m. I actually was uh, a little late. Uh, I was supposed to get there at three. One of my friends hadn't heard from in a while. He messaged me and said that, uh, asked if I was going and that I would be there. I told him yes, and I'd be there at around three o'clock. So for half an hour, he was probably wondering if I'd stood him up, but he was there uh, and he was actually on the other side of the park, uh, the parking lot there taking pictures of the, the skyline. So unfortunately, this was his, probably his first time taking a picture of a lunar eclipse. So he came with a, a huge telephoto lens and a not so sturdy tripod. So all of his, you're showing me the picture looked great. Uh, well, the image looked great on his uh, camera, but none of his images came out because they were, they were shaking. Like uh, it was pretty bad, but uh, you know, you always learn the first time we always, we, we've all gone through similar experiences. So my equipment were two DSLRs, two lenses, two tripods, the iOptron Skyguider Pro uh, tracking mount, two intervalometers, dew heaters, and a lot of snacks because uh, it was going to be about three, four hours in the cold and um, a man's got to eat. You got to you know, get some energy in the in fire in the, in the engine. So in terms of the cameras, uh, the first one was a 6D with a 12 to 24 millimeter Sigma lens. And this really is a really great lens for um, landscape photography, landscape astrophotography. It's very versatile because you have that uh, 12 to 24 um, focal length to play with. 
And I put this lens and all the details into Stellarium and I realized that um, I could actually go on a portrait rather than, portrait rather than landscape uh, orientation, which you can see here, this is the camera over here at 90 degrees. And the key here was I wanted to have one picture. I want to do this one more of a wide field picture so I could just leave the camera and not have it on a tracking mount and it would follow the moon all the way down to uh, moon set. And it, it worked out exactly as planned. And the second one was, of course, the T5i, and that was on the tracking mount, and that with a 180 a Nikkor lens, and that would give me a closer shot of the, the moon as it goes through the different phases of the eclipse. So I, before I get to the actual image, I'll show you, I put a, a brief YouTube short together on my channel, and um, it goes through the images fairly quickly, and I'll break down the images afterwards in terms of... Uh, uh, what they what the details were. So this is the the, the YouTube short. I don't see anything. Do you? Anyone? Shaquille, no, you need to change happening. your screen, sh your share, so that you're oh. sharing you, your YouTube now. Okay, so let me see. I can stop that. Um, let me see. Let me see if I can share it. Let's pause share. Can you share? I see. Okay. Let me see if I can share this. Aha, uh -huh, got it. Share. Oh, share. Can you see it now? Yep. Yep. Okay. All right. Let me play it again. Okay, so let me get, get back to the other screen. Okay, so this is the picture that came out through the 6D. And as I mentioned, I wanted to have it, it just starts off here in the umbral phase. So it followed all the way down. This is in five minute increments on the intervalometer. You had full eclipse around this phase here. And then as it was uh, at moon set, it just came out of the umbral phase, um, totality actually, the umbral phase. So I, this image was uh, focus stacked on the rocks, on the, on the, on the water as well. So it, it turned out pretty, it was a decent image. Um, in terms of the T5i, so this image is just before totality, and I wanted it in this image to capture the various colors of the moon. So you see the dark red here, see the orange areas here, and then you see the uh, yellow and white areas over here on this side. And of course, the image of totality itself. On both images, you can see the planet Uranus just in the corner there. And for this image, at totality it gets pretty dark. So I need to get I needed to get a bit more contrast on this image, so I stacked five images. I took I knew I've had this problem before with the lunar eclipses, so I stacked five images there, and that allowed me to bring out the contrasting features on the surface of the moon without blowing anything out in too much detail or too much too much light. So this image here is is one of the ones for the wide field and. The exposures on the wide field ranged from one uh, fifteen hundredth of a second to six seconds. Now, this is the one of the six second images. And what I really liked about this image was it the six second allowed the, the reflections on the water to be captured. And of course, the, the lights as well. The redness of the moon really came through in, in this image as well. And you can see up here, you can see the, the Pleiades cluster. You see the Hades cluster up here. And you see Aldebaran up there as well. So, and on a side note, um, 
Aldebaran, the star, it's um, the actual name, and I learned this fairly recently, the actual name of the star in Arabic is Ad-Dabaran. And Ad-Dabaran actually means the follower. And the reason it's called the follower is because in the sky, it actually follows the Pleiades. The Pleiades rise, rises first, and then afterwards oh. comes this star. So that's that's the actual name. A lot of the star names, I've been actually been looking into some of these stars. And they're, it's quite fascinating. A lot of them have real meaning and purpose, and they go back in centuries past. So, um, you know, this is just a, a little fact to, uh, to impress your astronomy buddies over tea and crumpets, I guess. And um, this is the one, the last image. And this is the image that really um, stood out for me for this eclipse, because when it was uh, moon set time, you had this, uh, you had the colors of the of the day of the all the trees, you have all these seagulls flying around in all directions over the water circling, and you have this ethereal orb sitting there just in the, in the blue sky. It was quite a sight, especially through 15 by 70 binoculars, but it really looked like you are standing as on a moon of Mars because it really looks like Mars with the polar cap on top, and you have this, um, you know, reddish uh, orb underneath it all. So that was one uh, memorable sighting and uh, aspect of this eclipse that was different from all the other lunar eclipses I've observed. So that's that. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Um, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Oh, beautiful pictures. Any questions from uh, anyone for Shaquille apart from? Congratulations again for taking some amazing photos. <clears throat> okay, well, I um, think every, everyone, if take a look at the uh, the chat, uh, Shaquille, you'll see uh, everyone just uh, appreciated your uh, your efforts there. Thank you. Can you can you hear me? Yep. Or, or am I muted? No, you're. We can hear you. Okay. Um, uh, beautiful pictures. Thank you very much. I'm I'm just curious to know how you adjusted the exposure as the moon got fainter. Did you somehow have an automatic exposure, or did you pre-plan that at this point it's going to be two seconds, and at this point it's going to be five seconds or whatever? And and how did you physically do it, and then have the camera not shaking when you took your next image? Yeah, no, no, that's a good question. So from past experience, from past lunar ex eclipses, I had a general idea what the exposure should be. So as um, it was, I mean, it, it, the running back and forth between the camera kept me warm because it was pretty cold. But <laughs> after the um, the picture was taken at the five minute interval, I actually went up and checked the exposure at that point. And if I needed to adjust it back and forth, then I just took a, I, I adjusted it right there and then waited for the shake to go down and then took another picture. So for each five minute uh, phase or uh, time interval, there's probably two or three pictures outside of that. Sometimes it was right on, but other times it needed to be uh, retaken. Okay, thank you. And thanks again, Shaquille. Very, very nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Dennis Gasparato with a... Uh, a review of the such and such and such and such short tube refractor and uh, a polar alignment app. Yeah, so welcome everybody uh, to our first session of the uh, of 2023. And I think we're blessed to see so or be able to participate in such uh, great presentations tonight. It's, uh, it's a great way to start off the year. Um, so I'm just uh, getting into the presentation now. Can everybody see it? Yes. Am I sharing it? Okay. Let me just go into full screen mode. So um, as uh, as Randy said, I'm going to be reviewing. There's a couple of things uh, I'll be doing. You're not in full screen mode yet. There, Dennis. Okay. So maybe I see it on mine, but I don't see. Maybe it's not. Uh, I don't know. I can uh, see it on mine. Yeah, unshare the share. screen. Ah, new share? Reshare, yeah, turn off sharing and share your pr presentation. Oh, okay, hang on a second here. Stop, share, okay. and then let me share the screen. Oh, it's it's still not doing it though. It's gonna, it's gonna uh, hang on a second here. Do, 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 do. There we go. Let me try to do this now. Uh, it's not, uh, it's odd. 
maybe Robin will tell you how to do it. Yeah, yeah, you just have to reshare. It sounds like you're on the right track. You just got to share the right screen. Yeah, but for some reason I cannot get out of, um, uh, hang on a second here. If, if, if you press alt tab, you switch from the different screens and maybe you could find that way. The problem is I don't think my laptop allows me to do that. Okay. Um, for some reason, um, if I screen share, it won't let me share. Um, hmm. I don't know. Let me try this now. Do, 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 That's do. good. Hang on. Is that better? Yeah, perfect. You got yeah, it. Yeah. All right. That's a bit of a roundabout way. Anyway, so I'm going to be reviewing a um, a short tube refractor. I mean, these this uh, category of equipment has become very popular in the past few years for for a number of reasons. You know, lightweight, portability, and quality, um, and versatility. Um, and, and the reason why I went this direction, and I've had four or five of these different scopes, and this is the only one I've kept uh, in addition to uh, um, a, uh, my NASCAR lens. And I'll get into that in a minute why that's the case. So uh, I'll talk a bit about the Astrotech uh, 72 ED2. Um, so this is a reincarnation of the uh, uh, 70 mil they had ED1 version. Uh, so slightly larger. F6, 432 millimeter uh, focal length. It is an ED doublet, but the difference for this telescope is that it has FPL 53 lanthanum glass. And, and the reason why that's important is because it will uh, provide um, better um, color correction. So the different spectrum of light will come to a more precise focus at the right plane. And, um, and it will withstand a higher magnification without having to have this uh, uh, color fringing that you see on brighter objects. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that later on. The other thing too is that it's uh, quite affordable. So we all live on budgets, especially now. Uh, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the pricing later on, but it's amazing affordability for what you get. The mechanics on it are excellent. It has a rack and pinion focuser, which is highly desirable if you're going to do any kind of astrophotography with this. Um, I have experience with uh, Crayford focusers on uh, other short tube refractors, and I can vouch for the problems that they create in terms of uh, slippage, if you have any kind of weight hanging off the back end of the telescope. Um, one thing to be aware of it, it uh, comes for the tube only. You do get rings with it, but there are no uh, finders for it um, that come with it when you purchase it or reduce or flattener. I bought this used, uh, quite frankly, because I couldn't get a new one. Uh, the lead times were just too great. And uh, I, even now, I, I think it's hard to get a hold of one. Um, and the other thing to let you know, it's not a pencil. So, so you do need to put a flattener on a reducer if you want to use it for astrophotography, for example. Um, and that has its own potential challenges. So I'll talk a bit about that later on. Here's a, a visual of the scope itself. Uh, it's a very sturdy design. Um, it's relatively lightweight, so it's less than five pounds, which is, which is really good because when you're using it on certain types of mounts, uh, and I'm using mine on my Skyguider Pro, but I also have a, a camera tripod I use it on. You can still wield it along quite easily and uh, the weight doesn't bother you too much. Um, as I said, you can actually attach, it comes with a double till plate. So I have attachments for a camera tripod. So it's really good for grab and go. You can just put it in a backpack and off you go. Um, and to me, that was very important because I want to be able to um, go to some parks and, and walk this into the park and, and use it. Um, the astrophotography part of it, I have not done much in the way of astrophotography. I've only done a couple of test photos with it, but I can tell you that uh, even under high magnification, the color correction is excellent. Um, in fact, I had a William Optics triplet before this, an 80 millimeter uh, William Optics triplet 
And the color correction was as good, if not better, than the William Optlix triplet, which is something to be said, and at half the price. So we've come a long way in terms of the, the, the glass. And um, I think it's a matter of, of uh, volume. They're producing so many of these now, they're getting very good at it. Um, as I said before, you, you do need to have, you're going to use this for astrophotography, you want to bring the focal ratio down. So 0 0.8 or 0 0.7 is ideal, uh, brings it down to a, a faster focal ratio. But you do get a little bit of minor star elongation at the edges, the very edges. Not much of a worry because if you're going to crop that image anyways, you won't see that. But just a, 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 this is a problem that exists with a lot of short term refractors is that when you put a reducer on it, I had a, a sharp star 61 before and it was a ridiculously bad situation with that. I mean, you put a flattener in there and a good uh, almost 20% uh, of the edge had quite elongated stars. This is not nearly as bad, but it's something just to be aware of. Pets full uh, optical um, uh, construction typically provides better correction in that regard. Um, the other thing too is because of its lightweight, it can be used with a lot of smaller tracking platforms. I use a SkyGuider Pro, Ioptron SkyGuider Pro, and it works really well with that. Um, it, you can actually put that along with um, your counterweight and uh, a small camera at the back and you're under the 11 pounds limit for that uh, SkyGuider Pro, which is really good. If you're traveling, I went out to BC earlier this year or last year and had this all in a backpack and it worked very well. And as I said, it's got a rack and pinion two-speed focuser, very solid, very little backlash. And for $800, uh, quite frankly, I think it's a, it's a great grab and go setup. I um, mean, it's not, you know, it's not gonna be as good as some of the, you know, uh, higher end triplets and things like that, but then you know, lighter weight, like I said, it's grab and go. It does what it does very well. Now, what I wanted to do is uh, the main reason for this telescope was was primarily for visual, uh, but I wanted to adapt it also for for astrophotography. So I started experimenting with various apps, and one app I came across, and maybe some of you have already using this app today, but uh, it's um, on the iOS um, platform, so it's in the, the Apple Store, and you can download this app. I think it's five dollars and it's Polar Scope Align Pro. And there is a free version called Polar Sky, uh, Polar Scope Align. This thing is light years better than that app. So it is so easy to polar align this. Um, and what I've done is I built this little adapter here for my cell phone. So I can actually align my cell phone with this the, uh, on, on the rings. I'm just gonna attach it to rings and I machined actually um, an attachment that goes on the rings so that you can actually fit this on there. And literally you can do a polar alignment anywhere within like a few minutes. Uh, with my SkyGuider Pro, just look up, you look at the, the uh, it, it'll, it'll take your GPS location, um, it'll give your Latin long, uh, you then point the telescope at Polaris and you align it to that X mark there for that particular date and time, and you are good to go. And it's quite accurate. The other thing this particular app does um, is turn your uh, platform into basically a go-to mount. Um, and in fact, it's the database on here is quite extensive. So they've got uh, a number of different, you get the messy objects at Caldwell, yeah, NZC, and several other databases on here, uh, including comets that you can upload and uh, add information to uh, in terms of getting the uh, coordinates. And what you do is essentially uh, you go to a setting. In fact, if I go back one, there's a setting at the bottom there called DSO. You click on that and then you push, you click on the object you want to, or you search on the object you want. And then you manually uh, move the, um, your, um, your telescope in RE and DEC or alt as, and until uh, this dot reaches the center and 90% uh, of the time uh, it's right in the center. 
in a in about uh, 45 power, um, uh, you know, with a, an eyepiece that gives you about 45 power or whatever. And uh, it's very, very easy to pick up your objects. Within a few moments, you're there aligned on that object. And I felt that feature was just fantastic. I mean, I've done my fair share of star hopping and, and things like that. But when I'm out and I, I don't necessarily have a lot of time with in dark skies, I just want to see the objects and it works really well. And I don't need to invest in a far more expensive electronic go-to. This just goes right on your app, on your phone. And um, there's an example of a photograph I took. That's one of the first ones I took, just to give you an example of, of the quality of this particular scope for, for what you get. So a short presentation tonight, guys, that's, that's uh, all I had to say. Pretty cool. Wow, that is impressive. Dennis, thank you for that. I'm, uh, I was scribbling away making notes. Uh, any questions for Dennis? Okay, so we look forward to uh, some more results in the future. But uh, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, okay, our, we've come to our, uh, our last speaker. Um, uh, it's Robin Metcalf. Uh, I think, Robin, is this your first presentation? It is. Oh, it great. Is. I think I've been after you for a presentation for a while, so uh, <laughs> it's paid off. I'm glad um, we finally worked it out. Yeah. And uh, the topic is, or the title is Adventures in Nightscaping Year One, which uh, I think is going to be very, uh, uh, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm looking forward You'll to see. it. Milky Way, Star Trails, Eclipse, and a Bear. What else could you want? Uh, it's the, uh, yeah, the, the this is, is a very low level talk compared to what you've just heard. Um, I've got about 20 minutes worth of stuff, so we might go a little bit over. I'm really sorry about that. Uh, but can everyone see the presentation mode? It's good. Okay, awesome. Um, okay, so I, I've been a RASC member now for, um, I think, three to four years, and uh, I haven't had nearly as much time as I would like to attend meetings and, and participate at events. I really hope to change that in the coming years because I, I just, I love what this group does and I really enjoyed the meetings. But um, in the meantime, since I've met very few of you in person, I'll just briefly introduce myself. I'm a physics and astronomy professor at York University, and I've been teaching there for over 20 years. In addition to teaching, I'm currently serving as the director of the Division of Natural Science. And this is a department that offers science courses to non-science students. So our courses aim to make science engaging and accessible to very large and very diverse student audiences. And uh, astronomy is such a great way to do that. Our astronomy flavored courses have always been among our most popular. And we've got several very cool astronomy courses taught by some really awesome and really talented communicators. Um, before I uh, got into teaching, I completed my PhD in extragalactic astronomy, and my research involved an imaging survey of about 100 dwarf irregular galaxies. So these are the smallest and faintest and most numerous galaxies in the universe. And the images were used to map out the distribution of galaxy mass in our local universe to see what that might be telling us about the underlying dark matter that has been theorized to be delineating the universe's visible mass. It's sort of like um, an invisible glue stick. So here you see one of the survey uh, papers from 2010. I'm listed by my maiden name there, Finger Hut, which by the way is German. It means thimble, right, a, a finger hut. And um, in this paper, we present some of our galaxy images and the measurements that we made from the imaging data. Now, really bizarre fact about me is that my actual hands-on experience with uh, the telescope is extremely minimal. And uh, how is that possible? Well, producing images of these very faint dwarf galaxies can only be done at uh, big mountaintop observatories. And if any of you have ever worked in or visited a major observatory, like in Arizona or um, Hawaii, then you know that 
the researchers don't actually get to touch the, the telescope. The telescope is steered by a professional telescope operator while the researcher spends the entire night in front of a computer screen. So even though I have spent countless hours on the proposing and planning of an observing run and the processing of, of telescope images, I have almost zero experience actually handling a telescope of any size. Now, what is starting to change that is that for the last several years in university teaching, there's been a trend towards uh, deviating from the traditional lecture to incorporating more active learning in the classroom, more hands-on activities. And the rationale for that being, to use a clever analogy that, that I heard at a teaching conference, you can attend a lecture or you can read a book on how to ride a bike. And then you can write an exam on that knowledge and you can get 100% on that exam, but there's still a very good chance that when you actually get on the bike for the first time that you're gonna fall over. So, you know, applying that to astronomy, you can get, uh, you can give a beautifully visual lecture on the cycles of the celestial bodies and how the sky moves, but until a student goes outside and actually tracks the sky in three dimensions, they don't really get that deep intuitive understanding of the cycles of the sky and how we can predict them. And also the challenges of, of observing the sky and the importance of keeping our skies clear of light pollution and satellite traffic and so on. So a couple of years ago, I decided that it was time to, uh, to walk the talk and I started to dabble in a little bit of nightscaping with the aim of developing hands-on activities for my students, activities that I am also capable of doing. So I'm gonna show you the preliminary results of those efforts, but just as a uh, disclaimer, I am still a total newbie at this. Unfortunately, I have very little free time to spend on this, uh, this awesome hobby, but I am totally hooked on it and I, I hope to do the same for my students. So here you see my very, very primitive setup. So far, I have stuck with a uh, DSLR camera, uh, a Canon EOS 70D with an 18 to 135 millimeter lens. And aside from the tripod, my only other piece of equipment is a simple intervalometer for um, programming sequences of exposures remotely. The, uh, this equipment has been very generously loaned to me by my photography partner, who is a newly minted RASC member, and he's he's somewhere out there tonight in Zooland. So I'm going to introduce him as well. Uh, I'm extremely lucky to have as a very good friend, a professional photographer. He goes by Jake the Brat. So there's his Instagram page. And for the last 40 years-ish, Jake has been taking pictures of all sorts of uh, interesting stuff and all sorts of interesting places. He shoots a huge range of subjects from the very small to the very big and the natural to the human made. But what I love most about his photos is what he does with the sky. He has this amazing way of making the sky really present in his photos, even when the sky isn't the, uh, the primary subject. And he's just a master of, of color. He enhances the sky's natural colors in really original and, um, and interesting and stunning ways. He's also dabbled a little bit in the celestial bodies. He loves to shoot the moon. And what is really handy about having him around is that he really uh, hoards photography equipment. He, he has a massive artillery of tools for capturing light. Uh, here you see his setup for the partial lunar eclipse in May of 2021. We drove out to the Oshawa Lakeshore to shoot it because the West GTA was, was too cloudy that night. So for the last two years, Jake and I have been wandering around at night in and around the GTA, shooting the night sky and, and figuring things out as we go. And he has very generously loaned me the camera that I've been using and very patiently taught me how to use it properly, even though 
I don't always listen to his sage advice and, and you'll see in some of the photos that uh, sometimes I just use stupid camera settings because I, I insist on experimenting and learning from my own mistakes. Uh, but in any case, I know Jake is looking forward to joining the RASC observing events and he's always very happy to share his, his knowledge and expertise with, with others. Now, at some point, I plan to uh, go beyond the DSLR and try some real astrophotography. And to motivate me to get up to that point, I recently purchased the uh, six inch telescope and mount that you see on the slide. By recently purchased, I mean last spring, I still haven't had the chance to learn how to use that stuff, which, which is horrible. But um, it might have to wait until I retire. Until then though, I'm very happy to bring it to RASC events and if others want to give it a spin, maybe even show me how to use it. They are very, very welcome. So uh, I've been shooting from uh, various spots and around the GTA and, and also some of the provincial parks within a couple hours drive. But where I've had the most success is up at our family cottage which we enduringly call the Fingerhut Cottage because the property was purchased 50 years ago by my father, Ray Fingerhut, and today my sister and I share it. So it's located in the town of Bracebridge, which is on Alport Lake. It's just a little bay off of Lake Muskoka, which is off to the left there. And um, little did I know when I was a kid, when I used to spend my summers up there and, and I rarely looked up because I was too busy you know, picking blackberries and, and chasing deer. But uh, it turns out that this spot is a really good place for night sky observing. As you can see in this uh, Bortle map, the sky brightness at this spot is, is quite good. It's Bortle 4, so you can see the Milky Way with the naked eye. And it's got a uh, pretty much uninterrupted view over the water from the southeast to the southwest, there's a little bit of light around the bay, as you can see in this southeast view. This is a 30 second shot, so it was a little bit too long. There's a, a wee bit of star trail there. And on the right side of the photo, you can start to see some annoying sky glow that's coming from the town of Gravenhurst, which is 10 kilometers due south. But it's, um, it's a pretty localized, glow, leaving lots of dark real estate to work with. So even when you're facing due south, despite the glow, and there's also some bright lights there from the marina, you, you can still see some, uh, some patches of the Milky Way up top. But the southwest side of the sky, that's where it's darkest. So you can just see a little bit of that sky glow to the left there. And uh, you can get some, some gorgeous sunsets in that direction as well. I didn't take this photo. It was taken by one of our guests. Uh, okay, this is an awful photo of the Milky Way that I took facing the Southwest. I had cranked up the ISO just so that I could see where the Milky Way was on my screen. And so of course the, the photo is really noisy as a result, but regardless, you know, the fun part about shooting the Milky Way is how you can align it with uh, with the landscape to make interesting compositions. So I just liked the way the Milky Way aligned with that, the entrance to uh, to the Muskoka River. And I'm looking forward to adding my mount to the setup because then I'll be able to do some, some cool stuff with longer integration times. Another fun thing that happened when I took this photo is that there were a bunch of teenagers around at the time, my sons and some of their friends, and when I called them over to look at the camera screen and they saw the Milky Way looking so bright in the image, they thought that the image was faked because they looked in you know, the direction that the camera was facing and they said, well, that's not there. And, uh, and I said, well, you know, actually right now you are facing the disk of our galaxy from our view and in the outer disk. And the only reason you can't see it is because your, your little human retina insists on resetting itself every one fifteenth of a second. And, uh, you know, the camera is collecting light for like 450 times longer. So it's always so fun to have those moments when, you know, you can see that you've just blown someone's mind that, you know, something is out there that, that they didn't know. Uh, as for the north side of the sky, in that direction you encounter, you can see a high 
tree lines, so your view of the sky is pretty limited. But as I learned last year, if you go up between late fall oh. and early spring, when the branches are bare, it opens up some really interesting views. And I'll show you an example of that in uh, very shortly. So I'm so grateful to have this spot because uh, as I'm sure many of you have experienced when you're up all night, it's so helpful to have shelter nearby for you know heat and food and drink and Wi-Fi and, and electric power. It just means that you can observe comfortably for longer and increases your, your chances of success. So it's a four season cottage uh, and we rent it out when we're not using it ourselves, uh, particularly in the fall, winter and spring. We don't list it anywhere. We just rent it by word of mouth and we have a bunch of families who have been renting it regularly for many years. So um, if anyone here is interested in, in trying it out for a little observing weekend, feel free to send me an email and I can, um, I can pass on some more information. Okay. Uh, this is another horrible photo. <laughs> so over uh, the last two years of getting into this, I've taken probably hundreds of, of photos. And of those hundreds, there's only two that I think are worthy enough to share with other humans. This is not one of them. But, uh, you know, that's what this hobby is like, right? It's like fishing. You spend hours doing it and, and you might end up with nothing good, but it's really just about the fishing. It's about being outside in a beautiful secluded spot and having the night to yourself. So of my, my two photos of, from 2012 that I don't hate, the first is of star trails. Again, not this photo. This is one of my very bad early attempts. It was taken from my friend's backyard in Stony Creek overlooking the Toronto Island Airport. So you see all sorts of air traffic cutting through the star trails. But um, what I love about shooting star trails is there's so many components to the composition that you can play with. The shape of the trails are so different depending on which direction you're looking. So you can really play with aligning the trails to the landscape in, in interesting ways. Uh, and you know, it's kind of tricky and, and technical and you really need the sky and the landscape to cooperate over long periods of time. So, you know, you, you gotta be patient. It's a lot of fishing, a lot of waiting around, trying not to, you know, drink your entire beer supply and eat all of your snacks. So um, interestingly though, the best stair trail photo that uh, I've taken actually came about entirely by accident. I mentioned that the north view from the cottage is pretty much blocked by trees, as you can see in, in this photo. But if you go to the road facing side of the cottage, you're facing our little rundown 50 year old bunky here behind which is a small lagoon. And in the late fall, when the branches are bare, you can see larger patches of the visible sky. So last October at around midnight, I set up my camera and the intervalometer to just take a continuing sequence of, uh, of 15 second shots. And then I left it there and I went for a walk through the woods with one of our guests. When I got back and I stopped the photos, I got this very, very cool spooky image of the star trails between the branches. I ended up with them um, only using about 15 minutes worth. And then I sent it to Jake and, and he helped me enhance the, uh, the contrast uh, just a bit, just to give it this sort of storybook appearance, which, which I really like. So um, I learned a lot from taking this photograph, particularly about the value of having an extended light source behind you to light up the landscape because I had the light from the cottage about 50 feet behind me, the, the um, exterior lights of the cottage were on. Okay, the second photo that I don't hate from uh, is from the total lunar eclipse from last November. So I went up to the cottage with my sister and niece, just get this playing, uh, to shoot the entire eclipse. So I, I started at around um, 2 a.m. just to start getting photos of, of the full moon and continued until 8 a.m. And I took sequences of short exposures every minute. I adjusted the settings whenever the moon went out of view. So here you see a video of, uh, I just use star stacks. Uh, it's just doing its thing here for the early stages of the eclipse. And here is the sequence leading up to the maximum eclipse. 
watching all of this unfold was it was a really spectacular experience. I remember in the uh, early morning, I was watching each successive image appear on the screen and I had totally lost track of time. And at one point, an image appeared in which the sky was noticeably brighter than the previous image. And realizing that the sun was coming up, I turned around to, uh, to the east and I was quite dazzled by, um, by all the colors after having been staring into the darkness for so many hours. So I just snapped this photo with my, um, with my phone, but it was just so amazing because I had no idea that the, you know, this was going on behind me. In any case, when I stacked the, uh, the final sequence using images two minutes apart, I got my, uh, my second image of 2022 that I don't hate. And what I like about it is that since the, uh, the stacking algorithm that takes the brightest sky pixels of the pack, the stacked image takes on that, that amazing purple from the last image in, in the sequence. And then after applying a little increase to uh, the contrast, I, I think I made it a little bit too grainy, but whatever, uh, you, you get this very cool contrast between the purple sky and, and the red of the blood moon. Okay, last slide. So you might be wondering from the title of this talk, what on earth does any of this have to do with a bear? Well, on uh, the evening of November 8, as I was driving my sister and niece southbound on Highway 11 on our way home from the cottage, we uh, struck and killed a very unfortunate bear, which I feel absolutely horrible about being a lover of animals and wildlife. But uh, this poor animal just ran at top speed on all fours into my van. I saw it less than a second before the impact it just left over the, um, the highway median. So here you see my van being towed away. That's my niece there. She's giving me the thumb, thumbs up for getting us through this safely. Uh, and here's the, the accident report clearly indicting my car V1 as the bear killer, even though the bear was, was hit again by the car behind me. So who really knows which car, which car struck the fatal blow. <laughs> uh, and to make the story even freakier than it already is, as I was arranging for a rental car, I was asked if I had any vehicle preference, to which I said any SUV will do. And when I went to pick up the car, the vehicle that they had reserved for me was a blood red Mitsubishi Eclipse Cross. So weird. <laughs> so that's my haul from 2022. I wish I could say that no animals were hurt in this presentation, but um, <laughs> uh, hopefully 2023 will yield more photos and less roadkill. So that's it. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. But now you can look up in the northern sky and see the bear forever. <laughs> that's making, very making, true. Making very star true. trails. <laughs> that was excellent, Robin. Thank you much, very much for sharing that with us. My pleasure. Um, any questions for Robin? Yeah, I had a question, Robin. The um, you had a your first picture or your first picture you liked of star trails uh, had some halfway down the bunky. Were those actually very low? Do you have? Is there clearance behind? where you can see it looked like star trails right uh, it's through the woods but very close to the horizon uh, I, I wondered if they were reflections maybe and i don't yeah i didn't know let me check let, let me yeah. sorry i should have kept that up um and i see the provider of the camera is visiting us as well yeah <laughs> yes and so yeah like if you have any questions for him you're uh welcome how close to the hippo were you jake <laughs> um, no, hold on can you hear me Yep. Okay. Uh, approximately that one was about 20 feet. Ah. Uh, on foot. On foot. You're not supposed to do that. <laughs> uh, luckily, I have really good guides and really good uh, staff that work with me when I'm in Africa. So it's pretty okay. cool. And you run quickly or at least well, faster than the slow guy. They can actually outrun you. No problem. The hippo. So yeah. it's the most dangerous animal in in Africa. Everybody thinks it's lions and everything. It's not. It's the hippo. Yeah. And it, it's a it's it's a beautiful animal. And like I it, we actually played this little cat and mouse game as I was approaching him, he was approaching me. And like we got to the point where it was about 20 feet, and that was like, okay, that's enough. 
<laughs> you win. <laughs> yep, you win. <laughs> so yeah, so it's one of my favorite shots of that beautiful hippo. Lovely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not sure what those lights are to the left of the bunky, unless they're reflecting. Oh, oh, the blue right over there. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. No, it's not coming from the water. That the lagoon is very narrow, so it's it's from behind. But I, what I think it is actually is that. Because uh, I caught this in some of the photos, is that what my friend and I, when we went for our walk, we had our headlamps on, <laughs> and I noticed, uh, and we we walked in that direction, and I noticed that there was a streak of light in some of the exposure. So I think that's what it is. Okay, it was sort of it almost uh, you didn't show it that long, and I didn't think of it in time, but it sort of looked curved, and I thought, is that an arc? Is that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool. Thank did, you. Any did other you questions? Nate, do you want to explain who about more about the hippo photo and that CEO in uh, New York or oh, something? Yes. So um so I saw my images are sold worldwide and um a banker of uh, an investment banker found that image through my agent and he wanted a specific print. So that particular hippo is six feet by six feet. Mm -mm. audio died oh we just lost you yeah actually the connection died yeah it, it, is there any chance you could scroll back to the hippo picture oh it's behind jake behind yeah. jake's picture if he if he it's sold so on a the six street. foot by six foot picture he should have made enough money for a decent internet connection <laughs> Come on, jake. It's, it's not only it's not only a six foot six picture it's printed on on a metallic surface Oh, and my. and so it and the guy has a giant desk so people come in and behind him is this huge wall side metallic oh photo it's just fantastic oh cool. not too intimidating yeah exactly wow all right well jake well jake has left the building <laughs> uh maybe he will come back um well that was great we're looking forward to uh parts uh, or year two of your presentation uh uh robin so that was uh that was excellent and look uh feel free to bring your telescope out to um, our members nights at riverwood and we'll uh get it going and oh that would be amazing and, uh, we can spend some time uh actually looking through it that'd be uh awesome. that'd be our pleasure yeah thank you i don't think we've ever had a richie Critchin. no i don't well, think so that same scope Are there any other comments or uh, as we come to the end of the meeting? Uh, yeah, I actually have a question. Yeah. Uh, so right now I, I don't have a telescope. So I was just wondering if anyone could like recommend a telescope so I could just like start looking at the night sky. You're a member for me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, you can borrow one free. Or you can buy one, uh, by all means. I, I'm just saying, before it's, it's worthwhile to actually try different scopes before you actually go and buy one, because then you've experimented with, um, you know, there, there are lots of different types, right? OK. OK, so how, how do I rent one? Um, on our one. website, there's a telescope mm -hmm. loan program link. It's in the member okay. section, I think. And yeah, then contact you... us. Yep. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'll meet Guha. I'll try and send you an email if I can find your email. Okay. A guy I know in the South Simcoe Amateur Astronomers, my first astronomy club, uh, is selling a eight inch Mead LX3 2080. It needs legs, but it's got a um, a uh, glass solar filter for 300 bucks. Oh. Um, yeah, you can like send me, yeah, I'll just put my email in the chat. Randy, you're on mute. If, if you're talking to us, you're on mute. Uh, yeah, I'm just suggesting Premi put his email in the chat and then Alan, if you could maybe uh, contact him. Okay, any other comments before we uh, end the meeting? All right, so um, 
that was excellent. Thank you to all the presenters. And uh, two weeks from tonight, uh, we will have our speaker night. It will be a Zoom presentation. And the topic is uh, Mission to Pluto from Napkins to New Horizons. So that should be uh, interesting as well. Um, and Randy, question. Um, how many of folks are going to the um, Brian Green talk at Roy Thompson? Show of hands or chat, whatever. Okay. My son bought me some tickets, so I'll be attending there that night. I look forward to seeing some of you if you show. Yeah, it should be, uh, well, yeah. be a lot of REC people at the talk. Cool. And I see Bill Nye is showing up uh, in town in, at the end of March as well. So, <clears throat> okay, I will pass on uh, good evening to everybody and we'll uh, see you in a couple of weeks. Thanks for attending. Thanks good all. Night. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Randy. Good. Bye now. Thanks. Good night. 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 Good